Let me just get my screen up here. All right. So um, I'm David Bernholtz. I'm with Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, and it's my pleasure to give this presentation on software licensing. I would, in addition to um, Ashley's uh, suggestion to use the Google Doc for your questions, I would actually like to use it to ask you guys some questions. So it would be really great if you guys could go there. Uh, right now, the link is on the screen still. It's also in the email that you received with all the coordinates about this presentation. I just want to say a couple of words here. The first and most important thing is that I'm not a lawyer and this isn't legal advice. So please, if you're doing anything of consequence, please consult with real experts here. Um, this is a presentation that's licensed under the Creative Commons license. I'll talk a little bit about that in the presentation. We will, as uh, Ashley said, have uh, the archives of this available, but I also have the presentation out on Figshare. And I'd like to acknowledge our sponsor, the uh, Department of Energy uh, Exascale Computing Project as well. So here's the, the sort of bottom line up front of this presentation, right? How you choose a license for your software, in my opinion, ought to be viewed as a tool to help you accomplish whatever goals you have. There is no universal right answer. So my hope with this tutorial is to present some common terminology that's used in discussing licenses, some examples of some of the considerations that might go into choosing a license, and to get you thinking about these things for your situation, not to give you hat answers <laughs> to things. So. There'll be a few points along the way where I'll be stopping for questions, but I've told Ashley if, um, if you put things on a page um, that seem particularly pertinent to any of those slides that I'm on, please go ahead and interrupt with those. So let me start out with some terminology and background information so we can set everybody's uh, scale, scale properly. Really. So, what we're talking about today is copyright, patents, trademarks, and licenses. These are uh, the first three are forms of intellectual property that are understood under the laws of pretty much every country in the world. Today, copyright grants the creator of an original work exclusive rights to its use and distribution, including limits on uh, derived works from the original. Uh, a patent grants the inventor of some new or useful and non-obvious idea, the rights to its production, use, and distribution. And a trademark is a sign or a design or a word phrase that identifies a product or a service. Um, you've probably heard of all of these things. You've probably uh, encountered most of these um, things in one, case, one situation or another. But just to give you a little bit of distinction, copyright is for a creative work which is embodied in a specific form. Could be a, a book or a paper or a recording or code, for example. Patent protects an idea. It doesn't have to be realized. Used back in the old days, you used to actually have to make models and provide them to the patent office of your invention in order to get a, a patent. That's no longer so patents are essentially ideas, and you don't need to really have prove that they can be executed, what, what the requirement is that they're not obvious to a practitioner in the field. Um, and then trademarks we encounter all the time. They're mostly used in, um, you know, marketing, advertising types of situations. Now, all of these things um, can um, use licenses to transfer selected rights from the owner of those rights, the owner of the copyright or the patent or the trademark to others. Uh, and so we're going to mostly be talking about software licenses uh, and mostly about copyright. But these uh, common software licenses sometimes contain clauses on patents and trademarks too. And we'll get into that a little bit as we go along. 
Okay, another important piece of information is that your software starts out copyrighted. Under the law, software you write is subject to copyright on creation. You don't have to do anything special to claim that copyright. And unless you specify some license for your um, creation, all rights are reserved to the owner of the copyright. Notice I didn't say all rights are reserved to you. Okay, the copyright owner may be you or your employer or somebody you've um, contracted to for the work. So work for hire is fairly typical. Most of us are employed by someone and, and oftentimes the software we develop uh, is in conjunction with our employment. Many employment contracts have um, exert IP rights over the things that you create. So my first question that I would like you guys to answer is who owns the rights to the work that you create? Um, and the way to answer that is to go to the Google Doc, and I'm going to switch over there right now, and um, put, please just put an X mark. It's, it's, we're going to kind of make a, a stack of Xs on each category for uh, the answer that applies to you. Okay, and I hope we can do this without treading on each other's toes. Um, looks like in most cases, people, uh, people's employers own the IP. Um, this is, it's, it's good that we're not seeing many in the I don't know category. Now, maybe not everybody on the call is being honest. It's okay if you don't know. Uh, my homework assignment to you, if you don't know, is to go find out. It's useful information to have. Okay, but um, this is, it, it's actually, if you're concerned about uh, the licensing of the software you produce and other things, then it's good to know this as a starting point. It helps govern who you need to talk to, who you need to get permission from, maybe what you can do, what choices you have, things like that. Okay? Well, this looks really good. So I see a few people whose employers, a lot of people whose employers uh, own the IP rights. I see a few people who um, own them directly, and I see a few people who don't know. So that's good. If, if people are still answering, that's great. I'm going to go back to the presentation. Uh, I can find the presentation. Here it is. Um, okay. So what, you know, one of the points here is that if your employer owns a copyright, you probably have to get some kind of permission from them to license and distribute the software. So that's definitely a consideration. One other um, thing that might be interesting is if you work as a federal employee, works created by the um, US government can't be copyrighted. They're considered to be in the public domain. The reason this was done originally was to prevent the US legal code from being controlled in access and made it, making it too expensive for people to be able to access to afford to buy a copyrighted copy of the laws, which made it hard for them to know what the laws were and to be expected to follow them. Um, but that has continued on, and, and all U.S. government work is uh, considered to be in the public domain. Now, um, another point of terminology is uh, different kinds of licensing. So licensing is really on a spectrum. On, on one hand, there is a term you've probably heard somewhere called uh, all rights reserve. This is a fairly common phrase to see. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum is public domain, which I just talked about. And, and what that means, all rights reserved, basically means that all of the copyrights um, are being held by the copyright owner, and they're not letting anything happen with that work. They're not licensing anything. Public domain is a complete disavowal of all rights so that anybody can do anything with it. In between, we have a whole range of different types of licenses. Some of those licenses are termed closed source or proprietary, and some of those are uh, discussed as free or open source licenses. And then within free or open source, there's further subdivisions that I'll get to in a minute. Okay, so on this question of free or open source, um, my opinion is that when you talk about free and licensing discussions, you should refer strictly to the freedom to do certain things with software. However, historically, 
the terminology has the, the use of the word free has often been complete, conflated with free as in beer, which muddles the discussion. So there's a couple of points here. One is um, nothing in the idea of open source or free software prevents you from making money off of it. So free as in beer is a completely separate consideration when it comes to software. Okay. Um, and because of the confusion and the way this, this term has been kind of muddied a little bit, I tend to use open source in most cases. Um, and this is just a, a, a preference of mine. If you look at the uh, major names in the open source community, you'll, you'll definitely run into two that are worth paying attention to. One is the Free Software Foundation, um, which are the folks behind the GNU Linux and, and other um, important packages that, that many of you are familiar with. And the other is the Open Source Initiative, or OSI. Um, both of these folks have definitions of what constitutes a free or open source license, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but there, um, there's a lot of information available about software licensing from both of these sources. So I put these URLs in here, and they're also in the end. I have a couple of slides of resources, and you can get to those. All right, any questions at this stage? By the way, we can go back to the questions, and we can go further down. And the lower part here, I see no questions yet. All right. Yeah. Sorry, David, I was trying to get off mute. No, we're good to go. That's fine. Um, okay, so what is free software? Well, the Free Software Foundation defines the four freedoms. Uh, that's the freedom to run the program for any purpose, the freedom to study how the program works and change it to do something different if you wish, um, the freedom to redistribute copies of the software unmodified, just as a convenience to help your neighbor, for example, and the freedom to distribute copies of the the modified versions that you've made so that others can benefit from your uh, changes to the code. And notice that the second and fourth of these requires access to the source code uh, to be able to exercise this freedom. Okay, these are, these, this is the Free Software Foundation's basic definition of free software. Uh, the Open Source Initiative has a definition which amounts to the same thing, but has a bunch more bullets, and it doesn't fit onto the slide as easily. Okay, so that is really the only reason that I haven't put it up there. But you can go to the OSI website and compare. And then within open source, you often hear phrases like permissive and copyleft, or viral licenses, or things like that. So, so what does that mean? Well, on the left side, you can see um, permissive. That means basically that the licensee, someone who receives a copy of the software under a certain license, a permissive license, can distribute derivative works as they see fit. That includes the possibility of relicensing those derivatives. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And you could relicense, in principle, you could relicense something into a proprietary licensing scheme. So some examples of li what licenses you've probably heard of that are considered to be permissive include Apache, MIT, and BSD. Um, and then on the other side, within this open source space, um, is copyleft. Interestingly, I put it on the right. I don't know why I did that. Um, but because in that spectrum I showed before, it's actually, um, it's actually closer to uh, uh, the, the far end. And what copyleft says is that the licensee must distribute derivative works as open source, typically under the same license that they received the work. And that gives rise to terminology that you may have heard about restrictive licensing or viral licensing. Because, so permissive licensing says, with a derived work, you can do whatever you want. We don't care. Copyleft says, we think we require, actually, that the derived work be distributed also as open source, okay? Some typical examples of that include the GPL, the new public license, and the LGPL, which is the lesser 
to do public license. Now, I've talked a lot about derived works in this case, in this slide, and I'll get to the definition in a second. But there's also an important note here, right? This talks about the distribution of derived works. You have to realize that you can hold a derived work private and never release it, and the, the implications of permissive or copyleft licenses don't matter if you never release it. Okay, it's only when you're um, uh, making your modified derivative work available to others that it really matters. Okay, so all this about derivative works. Derivative works. What's a derivative work? Well, it's an expressive creation that includes major copyright protected elements of a previously created work. That's the Wikipedia definition, and I like it because it's fairly concise. Um, so this basically means that if you take a copyright piece of software that somebody else has created and you make modifications, you've created a derivative work. That sounds pretty obvious, but what about the idea of taking their software without modifications and linking it to something that you did completely independently? Is that a derivative work, that executable that you've created by linking the two together? And in that case, does it matter whether you link it statically or dynamically? Or maybe you're, you're taking two different things and piping data from one application to the other. What is the composite? What's the, is the composite a derivative work? What about if you have a component in a coupled multi-physics application? So here's the challenge. One of the challenges that we face right now in, in the community in discussing licensing, right? Opinions differ about whether these things constitute derivative works, and there can be a lot of nuances here. So the Free Software Foundation, the folks behind the GPL, basically consider everything in a single derivative to be a derived work. This is part of the source of this viral label, right? So it infects other things. If you combine a piece of GPL software with other software, then according to the Free Software Foundation, that's a derived work, and it has to be released under the GPL in this case. Right? LGPL was specifically created to allow flexibility for libraries, um, and the difference from GPL fundamentally is that it says is linking is not considered to produce a derived work. Okay? For permissive licenses, these distinctions about what constitutes a derived work matter a lot less, as you might imagine, because because we don't care how a derivative work is licensed if we have a permissive license, um, then we care a lot less about exactly how we define a derivative work. Uh, but there may still be considerations there. And one of the other things this leads to is concerns over compatibility. So if you combine software under different licenses and create a derived work with it, what software license applies? And are the is it possible in a legal sense to combine different pieces of software under different licenses? We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Hey, David. Yeah. We do have a question related to this slide, if you don't mind me to interrupt. Yeah. Um, basically, the question is, is a code that is rewritten in another language, oh wait, the question is being updated, sorry. Uh, let me wait just, okay. Is a code that is rewritten in another language, the algorithms based on the old code considered a derivative work? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And there are different opinions on that. Um, and so one of the other things about this particular space is that almost none of this has been litigated. So there are no legal precedents to actually decide. So you have you know, some groups saying, yes, it is. Other groups saying, no, it's not and nobody has a clear way of deciding. And usually the lawyers will tend to be, if you get the lawyers involved, they'll tend to be pretty conservative. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go along. There, there are a few more questions, um, but we can also wait um, if you would like. So let's, let's um, do two things at once here. So here is, uh, on slide 11, here's a test for you guys. Um, this is a license that's actually used in, um, by an organization that I know for some of their source code, or some of their code. Um, and my question to you is, is this an open source license? And I'd like you to 
go to the Q&A and answer this at question two, just in the same way uh, that we did with question one. Okay, and to help you out, I've highlighted the first two clauses are the ones that are more important in determining the answer to this. And while people are filling that out, um, maybe we can go look at the other two questions. I'm, I'm actually going to leave this on the screen. Maybe Ashley, you can read me a question. I sure can. So um, the first question is, um, and I think it was on the last slide, is especially in the context of a community science code, who owns the right or has the authority to change a license? Is it the people who have contributed to the science code? That's a very good question, and I'll have a, a couple of slides about that as we go on. Okay. And then one other comment. Do you have an updated analogy as free as in beer and free as in freedom does not seem to be easily digested by many of the students that we teach? We use free as in a puppy, which works okay. <laughs> it might have been more of a comment than a question, but. Yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so we can all share our ideas for how to explain uh, the freedoms of software. Um, yeah, people can feel free to just add comments on that on that answer or that question. Um, we'll see what we come up with there. I don't, uh, I don't have anything else. I've never had anybody question me on it yet. Um, okay, so let me, sorry, is there more? Nope, I'm done, thank you. Okay, so let me go look and what you guys what, see what you guys said for the answer to this question. Okay, well, we're pretty evenly split. So there's a, a small majority uh, that think it is an open source license, um, and there's fewer people who think it isn't. Well, the answer is it's not because of the clause that, so you can, you can distribute the code as is without modification but you're not allowed to distribute modified versions of the code. Okay, so this violates one of the four freedoms. Now you might ask why they chose to do this. Well, one interpretation is they want to impose some measure of quality control over the modifications. Maybe in the past they've had problems with other people distributing code, uh, modified code with errors um, and they believed it reflected poorly on the original code. I happen to know that this is, in fact, one of the motivations for um, writing the license this way. Is this the only way to do it? No, not necessarily. Um, so there are some open source licenses that include a requirement that derivatives must be dis uh, clearly distinguished from the original, i.e., they have to carry a different name. Now, you know, one can ask about the enforceability of either of these things, right? If you give me a copy of your code, how hard, how much control do you actually have over who I give the source code to and whether it's modified or not? Um, and the same thing, you know, it, how, how quickly are you going to find out if I distribute code that's modified but it's still using the name of your software? So, you know, there's some, there's still some concerns there, but there are alternative ways to do this, for example, that can keep you in the open source realm. And this is one of the points that I want to get you thinking about. All right, let's go on to some um, discussions about how to choose a license. So really, as I tried to, tried to say at the start, you want to be thinking about what rights do you want to grant or retain, right? So you want maybe some control over who can use the program or not. Um, you want to control whether users can see the source code or they can modify the source code, whether they can redistribute the code, um, and how that modified code is, uh, whether it can be relicensed. And I've put in parentheses some of the considerations, right? So these may guide you towards proprietary versus open licenses, or permissive versus copyleft licenses, depending on where you're going with things. Um, we talked briefly, and we'll talk more, about compatibility with software under other licenses. Um, as I mentioned, permissive licenses have fewer issues with compatibility, so that might be one uh, consideration there. Um, one reference for this is the Free Software Foundation's discussion of licensing. They have a long discussion about compatibility. 
Um, you may be concerned about the labeling of dried words, which just came up in the previous example. So you can put clauses in uh, to your license that say derived works have to be identified differently than the original work. Um, patents are a different thing, as we discussed, but you can include clauses in your license that either um, provide a patent grant to users of the software, licensees of the software, or provide for retaliation if somebody um, sues you for patent infringement. Um, and I'll talk more about that. Um, and maybe one of the biggest, most important things here is what are the expectations of the community that you want to engage with your software? So in many cases, you're writing software that fits into a larger ecosystem, um, and there is a community there, and they may already have ideas about how software should be licensed. And to fit into their ecosystem, that may be an important consideration guiding uh, your decisions. Now we'll talk a little bit more about some of these considerations in uh, more detail, but I do want to say one thing that's really important. If you want to use um, an open source license, you're much better off going, off going with one that's already been certified as open source and vetted legally and is understood by the community than trying to create your own. It's a lot easier. There's more than 80 licenses out there that have been certified by either the Free Software Foundation or OSI as, as meeting their standards. And um, so that's a lot better place to look. You don't have to necessarily pay a lawyer. People know what your license means and, um, and can understand how to work with it. All right. So just um, to put some licenses that you've probably heard of into context, and I, I put together this table. It shows some of the common licenses whether these are open source, right? And so the, the question is whether they're permissive or copyleft. In some cases, there's a concept of a weak copyleft, like the lesser GPL. Um, I talk a little bit about compatibility with GPL, which is um, sort of more of a, is kind of the, one of the key licenses from a compatibility perspective. And I talk about whether they have any patent grants in, in the license. So you can see Apache. Uh, for example, it does contain a patent grant. It's compatible with version three of the GPL, but not version two, and it's considered to be permissive. Um, on the other hand, for example, um, the Eclipse public license down towards the bottom is considered to be weak copyleft. Uh, it is compatible with GPL, and it does include a patent grant. There are some uh, licenses, especially older licenses, that do not have any mention of patents, so we consider these to be silent. It's not that they're explicitly saying yes or no on patent grant. They say nothing. So I use the terminology silence. One other thing I want to point out is at the bottom of the list is something called the Afero GPL or AGPL. This is a relatively recently developed license. It's in the GPL family. Um, what it does here, the distinction, is to actually say that if you use this software, to provide a service. So now we're getting into the new model of software as a service. If you use this software to provide a service to the public, then you have to release whatever modifications you've made to that software under effectively a GPL style license. Okay, so it says that use over the network or offering a product over the network is equivalent to actually distributing the source code, which is interesting given the rise of these software as a service type of um, uh, activities now. Um, I don't expect you to actually read this chart, but this is interesting. There's um, GitHub has a bunch of interesting things, open source guides and things like that. One of the things that they've put together is called chooseolicense.com. Sorry about the phone in the background. Um, this is essentially a decision tree um, to help you decide how to license your code. But it's backed by a repository with an analysis of 30, more than 30 widely used licenses. And if you, if you go in at the front side, choosealicense.com, you'll get the decision tree. But if you find this appendix, 
that I've got the URL to directly right there, you can get this table. And this table, I know you can't read it, but across the um, left side are the rows are a, a bunch of different licenses that you many of which you've probably heard of, and that across the top are different characteristics or features of that license. And you can see, you know, like whether they have patent clauses, um, how they stand on different things, permissiveness, and things like that. Um, and and this is, I think, this is very cool if you want to be able to look at uh, sort of get an assessment of what license might meet certain needs needs that you have uh, fairly quickly, or at least narrow down to some of the right ones to look at. Um, the other interesting thing about this, this is all implemented as a, a GitHub repository in Jekyll. And if you want to actually add to this, they're open to pull requests to help improve this. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, one of the things we talked about briefly and a lot oftentimes comes up is um, what's the business model associated with your software? As I said, free or open source software has nothing to say about whether you um, can make money off the software. There are a lot of business models out there that um, will work perfectly well with uh, free or open source software, including selling the software, right? So you can actually sell the software. There's nothing to stop you. If, of course, it's open source, people might be a little bit foolish to actually pay for it. Oftentimes, what you sell is the convenience. You sell it as uh, in a packaged form. That's what a lot of the Linux distributions do, or pre-compiled executables, or things like that. They don't have to. You don't have to. The customer doesn't have to build it themselves. Sometimes you can sell professional services around the software, training or technical support or consulting. You know, software maintenance types of things. You can sell custom development services. We talked a little bit already about software as a service. Um, there's also a freemium or a dual licensing model. So every, I think everybody's probably encountered freemium. You get one tier of capability for free, and then if you pay something, you get a higher tier of capability. Um, and then there's this idea of dual licensing. It usually takes the form of um, if you're using it in a non-commercial context, it's subject to an open source license. If you want to use it in a commercial context, then you have to contact the copyright owner uh, to obtain a, um, a commercial license, which might have royalties, or a so a proprietary license, they might charge royalties or something like that. Okay, and of course, in, in our community, one of the things that happens a lot is we sell the research that's related to the software. This, so the software might be a product of the research, and really what we're selling is the research. Right, so those are a lot of um, important possibilities. Now, going the other direction, what if I don't want other people to be able to profit from my software? Okay, so I'm happy to profit from my software. That's great. But I really want to put my software out there as open source, but I want to prevent other people from profiting from it. Well, a, per, a, a permissive license allows someone to take derivatives proprietary. So they could actually take it, make it proprietary, and sell the software and, and do whatever. If you don't like that idea, a copyleft license will prevent that, okay, legally anyway. But there may be other considerations that you want to um, take into account here. So what if you actually do want a commercial entity to be able to use your software? So you might get broader exposure, broader distribution. One good example in our community is what software packages does, say, a computer vendor distribute with their systems, especially on the big iron that we put in our computing facilities, right? And um, so a lot of that's based on free software. You want to limit what they're willing to take on. Copyleft licenses are scary to a lot of commercial entities because of the potential viral nature and the fact that it hasn't been litigated how far these viral licenses actually reach. So legal opinions differ, but my experience is that a lot of companies just won't consider working with copyleft software. I've also heard of some other cases where they will work on copyleft software, but they can consider the staff who are doing that to be, in a sense, contaminated, and they won't allow them to work on any other software so that there's no chance of transfer, inappropriate transfer of intellectual property from copyleft software to non-copyleft software. Um, 
which can be limiting to the staff members involved and, and may make it perhaps undesirable for them to work on it. it. might be hard to find people willing to do that, even if the company is willing to take it on. Um, and even in non-commercial environments, copyleft may raise compatibility concerns. And we'll talk a little bit more about compatibility as we go. Um, okay, so I'm fine you know, releasing my software, but I don't want somebody to scoop me with the software that I've written. Okay, well, if it's under a proprietary license, you can keep the source private. Maybe you just release binaries, something like that, allow people to use it, but they can't see what's inside. Um, that's one way of protecting your, your um, intellectual property. Um, Open source licenses don't actually require, as I mentioned, that you make derived works public, only that if you do, there you make the source available. So there are also strategies with uh, open source software environments that maybe you can delay the public release of the modified software until you've had a reasonable chance to exploit the results. So you set yourself a goal of getting some initial papers published, which show the um, novel nature of what you've done, and then once they're out there, maybe then you're willing to release the novel software that's associated with it. And maybe you're less worried. You've got your proprietary stake in the ground. You've got first interest in this capability, and, and maybe that's one way. Another thing to do would be to consider a fixed time period. Say, I'm going to delay putting this out for one year, and um, this is something that happens in academic publishing sometimes. Maybe a sponsor wants open access, but um, a, a proprietary or a, a for-profit publisher needs to be able to make some money off of this. So they compromise on a, a proprietary exploitation period where the publisher has sole rights, uh, maybe for about a year, and then it goes into some open repository for the paper. You could do similar things with code as well. Okay. Um, before we get into the patents, I want to stop and see if there are any new questions. Hi, David. Yeah, we have quite a few in the um, Google Doc. Do you think you have time to address them now? Um, maybe a couple. Let me um, okay. try to switch and look over what we've got. Um, so I'll talk more about compatibility. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about patents. Um, so here's a question. What prevents private company from taking GPL license software and incorporating it into their proprietary software. Um, in fact, nothing. Um, it would not be legal. There are organizations out there that are on the watch for this. One of the common places that you see this is in things like network routers and other devices that you often buy for home use, maybe your smart television, things like that. There's a lot of um, open source and, and particularly GPL code that is used in a lot of those. You'll oftentimes see their license statements as on one of their menu screens. Um, there, technically, there's, or sort of pragmatically, there's nothing to prevent that. But there are organizations who have, who have actually sued vendors to make um, ensure that GPL licensed software that vendors try to incorporate into their products and things like that is actually um, released as it's supposed to be. Uh, time limit for licensing, there is typically no limit for licenses, although it is possible for licenses to be revoked. So I've never seen um, a, a normal license, uh, open source type, type of license that says this is only good for a year or something like that. It's fairly common with uh, proprietary license that have limits on, say, software maintenance contracts and things like that, but even in proprietary cases, many times they'll say, you have the license forever, but you have to pay on an ongoing ba that basis for the maintenance of that software, and that's how they um, make some money off of that. Um, 
licenses, uh, most licenses are recognized internationally, though laws do differ. So um, there may be some differences in the interpretation, right? As I said, as I've indicated, there's not a huge amount of litigation yet in this space, especially in the open source software space. So we don't have anywhere around the world, there has not yet been a lot to, to look at and say, well, you know, France is treating it differently than Iceland, treating it differently than the United States, treating it differently than Mexico or something like that. Um, as a copyright holder, can you select multiple licenses? Yes, you can. That's this idea of dual licensing. And if I get a chance, I'll um, go into that more later on. Um, these are all really good questions. I'm going to, however, go back to the presentation and, and continue there. Okay, so we've had a couple questions about patent clauses. Um, so software patents can be a serious consideration today. Whether or not you philosophically agree with the idea that software should be patentable, um, they're real in most parts of the world, and you have to deal with them. Um, and the important fact here is that if you're using a piece of software, even if it's open source, that's covered by a patent, and you don't have a license for that patent, you're infringing, and you could be sued. Okay, so it can cost you money. It doesn't happen that often, but there are some times um, when these things, you know, some something rises to a level where somebody kind of notices and gets upset about it. Um, so, as I said, a lot of the older software licenses out there are silent on patents. This was not a consideration early on when the open source community was first developing. But there are newer licenses that do include patent clauses, right? So the most common thing you'll encounter these days is what's called a royalty-free license to use patented content. So basically, in a, in a license like Apache 2.0 or GPL version 3, there's some clause in there that says, I give you the right to the I give you a royalty-free license, which means you don't have to pay for it, for any patented material covered by this software that I'm giving you a license to. Okay? Um, there are a few licenses out there that explicitly say that they don't grant any patent rights. So that means they're not silent. They're explicitly not giving patent, um, any patent protections. Um, and one example of that is a, a variant of the BSD three clause license called BSD three clause clear. Um, and the clear is it's clearly not providing any patent rights. There's this other idea called the retaliation clause. And basically that says if you, if you as a user of my software, a licensee of my software, sue me for patent infringement, that terminates this license, okay? And sometimes it's a little bit bigger. It says that terminates all licenses for any software that I hold copyright to, okay? So that's, that's meant to be a discouragement from somebody picking up a piece of software and saying, oh, I think this is covered by some patent that I own and I'm going to sue you for it, okay? You can see that these, there's a certain weakness there uh, because you still have to deal with the suit and um, that can be expensive, whereas you know, the, the person who's raising the suit may not really care um, about the software, they care about the fact that you're using infringing on their patent. Um, so anyway, so these, these are the kinds of things that you will find when you're looking at patent clauses. But, so, I thought there was, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I may have missed out a slide. Um, hopefully we'll get back to it. So now, um, on to the license compatibility question. So in practice, most of the software we produce today is some kind of um, combined work, right? So you get multiple packages from different sources, different libraries, things like that and you're trying to link them together to form one executable or something like that. So 
are the different licenses compatible? Can you, in a legal sense, actually put together an executable and use it? Is it considered a derived work? So I've already said different licenses have different concepts of what constitutes a derived work and what licenses must be applied to the derivatives. And there's little case laws for this so far, and there are different interpretations for this. So it's this is still a pretty gray area. I'm going to show you one interpretation of compatibility in a second, but I, I think the fundamental message here is that this is not worked out. It's starting, it's and it's not something that most software developers have been strongly concerned about. Recently, I see larger projects starting to pay more attention to license compatibility issues, but it's still not front and center for a lot of people. So just to give you a quick idea of the meaning of license compatibility. Here's a picture that is, um, I think, consistent with the Free Software Foundation's ideas about um, compatibility. And it shows you different types of licenses and arrows connecting them. And um, basically, software that's governed under one license can be combined with software that's governed under another license if there's a line connecting them. And the license that would apply in that case is that if at the head of the arrow. So if I took something that was covered under BSD and I combined it with, um, say, LGPL version 2.1, um, the product, according to this reasoning, would have to be licensed under LGPL 2.1. Okay, so you can see basically you're going towards the anything that's permissive um, can be combined pretty easily with things that are um, copyleft. Protective here means copyleft, weakly copyleft or strongly copyleft. And, um, and the result tends to be the stronger protection. Right, so um, like I said, there are different interpretations of this. There's a few other um, sites, websites at the end of this presentation that you can see other interpretations of how this compatibility works. And uh, it's kind of all I want to say about this, except that if it's something that concerns you, then it, there's a lot that you can dig into and a lot of discussions about this. So I don't want to sound like I'm against open source. I'm definitely not. Um, but if you need to make the case to somebody like your employer that software should be released open source, um, these are some of the things that you might want to think about and, and use in your argument. So if you're doing proprietary licenses, um, they're not really meaningful unless you're tracking them in some way. So typically you have to have somebody sign to accept the license. You may have to manage payments and things like that. Probably need to keep records of who's actually signed these things if you want to enforce your licenses, right? Um, my experience, because I work for a national laboratory, I can't sign anything on my own accord. If I want to have a license agreement signed, I have to go consult with the lawyers, and they're the ones who sign it, not me. Okay, so that's an additional hurdle that people would have to using your software if it's not open source license. Okay, um, and that's the explicit license agreement kind of thing. So I have to get somebody to sign it. I have to go through all this trouble. Um, and that can take time here. You know, we're short on lawyers. It can take a couple of weeks to get something reviewed. I can't just go to a website and make a pull request and be done with it. Um, another consideration is that I want to support peer review and reproducibility in science. I think that's a really important thing. So that's a lot easier to do with uh, openly available code. Uh, some sponsors actually require that um, open uh, software be released as open source. I think that's um, uh, that's a pot. I have an example from the Department of Energy at the end. You can see um, see their terminology for that. They expect all the uh, code that they develop to be released under open source if possible. Um, the results of publicly funded research should be publicly available. That's another consideration that uh, many people have. Um, and then this idea of building a self-sustaining community around a piece of software, that's very hard to do if you're controlling the access to the software, the source code too tightly. 
Okay, now um, I want to go back to our real world licensing example and look at the last two clauses that we kind of ignored before and see if you guys have some thoughts about why they might have been added to the license. So these are um, questions four and five at, in the Q&A sheet. Um, so why do you think they included a clause that says prior to publication, you have to email the owners of this code a draft of your journal article um, for them to review it? And then the, the fifth question is um, they're asking you to include in presentations or papers um, a name, the proper name of the code that you've got and appropriate references that go along with that. So in this case on the, on the Q&A sheet, um, just take a bullet, make a new bullet and add a couple of, um, add a, a few words of what you think explains the reasoning for this, if you don't mind. And at the same time, I can try to uh, answer any new questions that may have come in. All right, looks like that's pretty good. Hey, David, I think we just got one in chat. Um, okay. And I'll plop it in there, but basically it says, if you if you open source your software as BSD, but it uses a library that is weakly permissive, what responsibility do you have to alert potential users of these dependencies and differences in licenses? Mm. It's an interesting question. I would I, I am not aware of any particular norms that have been expressed for that or any particular expectations. Um, I think if you wanted to really observe license compatibility carefully, you would ensure that um, your code and the dependencies um, all have licenses that are compatible in some way, right? Not put the onus on others to uh, be aware of it. Does that make sense? All right, we've got some answers here. Let's take a look at, at what people have said. So why might they ask for advanced copies of the publication? Uh, to try to prevent uh, bad results from being published? Um, try to make sure that the results are interpreted correctly. Uh, try to ensure that no protected information is published. Track who's using the code. Um, ensure that there's adequate acknowledgement. Those are all very reasonable um, ideas. Um, why might they ask for their code to be cited? Here, I couldn't figure out a snarky answer to start this one off. If you notice, the other one is because they need more things to read. But, this one, people thought maybe trackability of the version and the uh, ability to reproduce results, uh, to be able to demonstrate to soft, uh, sponsors the adoption of the software, uh, increase the author citation counts. Yes, that was going to be one of my snarky answers, but it's maybe too real. Um, uh, credit, yeah, credit is the counterpart to citation count. So let's take a look at these two questions. So. Um, Item four in the, um, in the license, basically, in, for these guys was an attempt to address prior experience with users misusing the code and generating publications that had erroneous results. That obviously would reflect poorly on the code, even though it's the user's fault, essentially. Um, so that's, that's probably an understandable um, concern for software developers. Um, if they don't know well the users of their code, but it obviously creates a burden on the code owners to respond to these things. And I'm not sure how strongly they attempt to enforce this. So if you use their software and published something um, and, and they hadn't seen an advanced copy, you know, are they gonna send you a nasty gram or tell you that they're violated, you violated their license and they can't, you can't use the software? anymore. I don't know. I'm not sh I haven't asked that question of them. Um, this is something that I have not really seen in open source licenses. Uh, so it's kind of not a standard clause um, that I know some alternative way of 
enforcing or, or putting into the license, the enforcement is a separate question. You could always do this in a less forceful way in the README or things like that, and you know, sort of offer to work with new users, have mailing lists where people can ask questions and things like that. So there may be other ways to mitigate some of this so that you don't necessarily have to put this in a license and, and make it, um, you know, make a, a, an unusual license that people don't know so well how to deal with. Um, then the fifth clause, um, to include a, uh, the name of the code and appropriate references. So here, I, I think people in the Q&A got it right. There's a natural desire that your software that you produce be credited in papers where it's used. I think this is a very reasonable expectation. Um, this kind of clause doesn't violate any of the free or open source software principles that we've talked about. There are licenses out there that require attribution, but usually only in the source code, not in publications that are based on using the source code. So I'll talk in a few minutes about Creative Commons, which does can include an attributions clause um, that's more direct, but by and large, the the concept of attribution and open source licenses is not the academic concept of attribution or citation. There are, however, alternatives which are becoming uh, increasingly recognized in the community. And one of those is to put in, you can put it in your README, but now people are more often putting a separate file that says it's named citation. And this is effectively how you would like your software to be cited. It's a way of asking for a particular citation and saying a citation. And this is this gets to one of my pet peeves, right? I want to try to cite the software that I'm using. And I go to somebody's web page for a package and they list all 50 publications that have ever been associated with the development of that package. What they don't give me is here's what we would like you to cite when you're when you're mentioning this package, right? Because all the 50 papers talk about individual little developments. And I don't have time, I can't cite all 50 of them, and I don't have time to sort out which one is has some kind of comprehensive, you know, um, description of the of the software products. So I think a citation file or some way of saying, here's how I'd like my code to be cited is a very valuable thing. And I don't think it has to go into a software license. That's my opinion. All right. Um, I'm, I would stop here for questions, but since we did that not too long ago and I'm short on time, I would like to move on. Um, software licenses can be changed. So this is this idea of relicensing. Relicensing of code is not necessarily easy. In general, anybody who contributes to a code holds copyright interest in that code. And if you want to relicense it, you have to contact every contributor and get them to agree to the relicensing. This so, is, so you may lose track of contributors and things like that. So this is kind of between you and your lawyer is what constitutes due diligence, right? Um, there are mechanisms called contributor license agreements or con contribution transfer agreements that can simplify this, but they present different challenges. So basically, these are ways of saying explicitly when, when there are agreements for people to contribute code to a project and they're saying, you know, I'm giving you perhaps the right to relicense this at some later date without consulting me, or I am transferring my copyright to you, so you now own the copyright in that work. There's various good reasons to do that. Um, there's also um, reasons why you might not want to do it. And the biggest thing is it creates barriers to entry, and it may discourage people from contributing. And I can tell you a personal example. We had a project here. Um, where we were supposed to be contributing to a, um, a software project, it's open source, but it had a contributor license agreement. Our lawyers wouldn't sign it because they didn't like a patent clause that was included in it. We lost the project because we couldn't sign that CLA and we couldn't contribute to the software project. Okay. There are, um, there's some discussion about this kind of thing in the community. People think there are other ways, better ways to do this. And on the resources, I've got some other ideas, other people's viewpoints for how to uh, approach these kind of challenges. So now you've decided to license your software. Now you need to make that explicit. So you need to put notice of 
your copyright, you would need to assert your copyright, and you need to make clear what license you're using and the terms of those licenses, that license in your code. You do this at the top of every piece of source code. You have one central file in your whole repository that says license. How do you do that? Well, the best practice is to do a combination of both. Um, and there are some resources down here that can help you navigate that in a sensible way. And one of the things to pull out is oftentimes authorship uh, and, and the ownership of the copyright and things like that are conflated, but there are ways to separate those out um, that can be useful and make things a little more sane all the way around. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we do is software, but a lot of things aren't. So for example, this presentation. Um, Creative Commons is a family of licenses that has been developed that are analogous to open source, but meant for non-software products, so other types of creative work. There's a whole family of these that, that are listed here, whoops, sorry, um, and you can go to the website creativecommons.org and see a, a lot more details about the different combinations. But basically, any of these map to more or less permissive open source style licenses. There's also something called CC0, which is um, a way of saying I'm putting things into the public domain. Um, public domain is not well defined in all legal um, territories, so it may not be effective in, in all places. Um, and now I'm at the end here. I've got a slide of resources. These are all the things I've talked about. Uh, in the presentation, I also want to encourage you to talk to your institution's technology transfer office or to an intellectual property lawyer who's knowledgeable about software, and also talk to your colleagues and learn from their experiences with this. And then at the end, um, I've got a couple more pages of resources that I've gotten from others. I haven't had time to carefully vet these myself, but I really I trust the people who are um, pointing these things out. Neil has a presentation similar to mine that he gives, and these are some of the resources that he points to. And then uh, colleague Todd Gamblin at Livermore, we've had various discussions, uh, discussions on various topics, and these are some of the things, um, more detailed discussions that Todd points to. Um, and with that, I'll apologize for running over and try to take any last questions from anybody who wants to um, hang around for a second, but we need to let Osney back in to mention the um, January webinar. Hey, David, thank you. Uh, if people are willing to stay around, I have two more minutes for... David, can you hear me? Yes, yes. So would you take a few more questions from people that um, are willing to stay a few more minutes around? <laughs> uh, well, I can, but why don't you put up your slide first on the um, January webinar so people are aware of that. sharing it 